Hey, Tommy, can you believe that we've done five episodes of Talking Cars? I can because we spent five hours doing them. <laughs> and this, by far, is going to be the best show we've done because we have a very special guest. Do you know who that is? Yeah, we are talking to the head of Jeep in North America here. Jim Morrison. Yep, Jim is going to be on the show, and we're going to, of course, delve deeply into all things Jeep in this episode. Uh, and more importantly, we're going to find out what is happening with not just Jim, but with the brand, where Jeep is going, and where do we expect to see Jeep in five, ten years from now, or at least as much as he'll tell us. We're going to try to pry out every bit of information that he'll let us. And hopefully we'll get you guys some juicy um, new knowledge on where Jeep is going as a brand. Yeah, but before we do that, let's take a walk behind the scenes, Tommy, and kind of give these guys probably the most exciting Jeep adventure and story we've done over the last 10 years. And that, of course, is Motor Mountain USA. And Tommy, what was that crazy thing we did with the Wrangler about five years ago? Well, the idea was to drive a Jeep to the 50 highest points, 50 highest drivable points in all 50 states over the course of a year. So we took this red um, unlimited Rubicon and just kind of hit the road. And we hit all 50 states, you know, in the contiguous U.S., as well as uh, Alaska and Hawaii in this Wrangler. Sit back and relax or keep driving if you're driving. TFL Talking Cars is on the air, the world's most popular car podcast. Okay, maybe not yet, but we're working on it. It was quite an adventure, and um, we learned a lot about the Wrangler, and we learned a lot about ourselves, uh, and we learned a lot about America. Uh, and so let's talk about some of the highlights and some of the lowlights of uh, going to all of the highest 50 points in all 50 states. And I'll start with the lowlights. Um, the way that we did this was we broke the continental U.S. up into four quadrants, right? So we didn't do it all at once. So we did the Northwest northeast, the southwest, and the southeast, uh, and hit all the states in two weeks of driving and getting about, what, 20 or 25 states. And I suspect the most interesting one was where Nathan and Andre went to the highest point in Florida. You know what the highest point in Florida is? It's not that impressive, if I recall. <laughs> yeah, it's like a dog park <laughs> in the panhandle. It's like 300 feet above uh, sea level and... Um, the cool thing about all these places is that there's usually like a U.S. Ge geological survey marker that you can find when you go to these places that gives you uh, the elevation and gives you kind of the fact that, that you are there. And a lot of these places also, when you reach the highest point, uh, have uh, like a little box where people have gone and they've signed their name and they've kind of, you know, done a little story where uh, they came from and where they were going. Uh, and in Florida, we were trying to geocache um, this belt buckle that we had done for the series, right? So we decided that to get our viewers interested in it, we would make this very expensive Western belt buckle, which costs like $150 out of gold and platinum, that would be made for each state. And then we would geolocate these. In other words, we would hide them with the Motor Mountain USA t-shirt someplace, and then when the video came out, we would give you the coordinates so whoever was first uh, to watch the video and go to that park or go to that place would get that. Uh, and by the time we had driven down to Florida, people had figured out that this is what we were doing, right? Right. And so, you know, we were trying to hide these things in like bushes and, you know, in under rocks, under rocks and in sand. Yeah. Um, right. and, and it's really hard to do that in a little dog park in Florida. And so Nathan and Andre were driving around and somebody figured out that we had the Motor Mountain Jeep because, of course, it said Motor Mountain on them. And they couldn't lose this person who kept driving around and around following them as they were trying to hide this uh, geocache, this stash of, you know, belt buckle, T-shirt. I think there was a sticker in there as well. We should explain they weren't – it wasn't made out of real gold and platinum. It was. It wasn't like – well, $15,000 was, was a $150,000 belt. It was a $150 belt buckle. I mean, there <laughs> Not was, 150000 No, no. It wasn't, yeah, it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't all gold. It was gold <laughs> right. leaf and platinum, but they were really cool. And then the other cool part is once people would find the belt buckle, we'd ask them to take a picture of them and send us the image that they took with the belt buckle and if they had a Jeep with the Jeep. And I'm looking at the page right now on TFL Car, and I think we have – 
just about 45 states and 45 different pictures of people and their Jeeps or their families um, actually claiming these these buckles. And there's some that went missing and some that were taken without being registered, right? But the cool thing about this was it, it kind of brought some community members together and it was like an exciting scavenger hunt because if we could, we'd hide them off road in kind of tricky to find locations. And it was just a, it was a, it was an all around great time, but definitely without its challenges because when we're driving forty thousand miles in a year in a Wrangler, you know, in through blizzards and across deserts in the summer, <laughs> there's definitely some interesting memories to be had. Yeah, and keep in mind, guys, we drove it to the highest drivable point, not to the highest point, right? So like in Alaska, which is a really cool state that me and you got to do, we didn't drive to the top of Denali, which is the highest point in Alaska, but we drove to the top of Aragon Pass. Adigan. Adigan Pass, yeah, which yeah. is on the Dalton Highway going up to Prudhoe Bay. And let's talk, let's talk about the adventure we had up there. Do you remember when we... Uh, um, so first of all, uh, when you go on the Dalton Highway, right, the, it's a 500-mile stretch of road that basically follows um, the Alaskan pipeline. So oil is um, is uh, is drilled and uh, gotten from the ground up Prudhoe Bay, and then uh, it goes via the pipeline all the way down to I think Fairbanks and then beyond Fairbanks uh, to some place where it's actually distilled. And so basically, that highway is used for trucks running up and down with refined oil to then make the refiner then to make the the oil exploration and production work up in Prudhoe Bay. So it's basically a dirt road that 175 or 180 trucks go up and down every day. And these trucks do not stop. Yeah, and they have to keep moving and moving and moving because in order to suck the oil out of the ground, they need machinery that uses diesel and gasoline. Right. And they run pretty much 24-7 along the Ice Road Truckers Road. So they actually filmed Ice Road Truckers at this location, and it's in the very northern tip of Alaska. It is incredibly remote. It's in the Arctic Circle, actually. And it's hard to get to, especially yeah. in the winter. Now, we drove it, I think, in August, yeah, so we, there was no snow. Yeah, we drove it in August, and it was still pretty cold. I think it was, like, in the 60s. Uh, and it was at a time when we had, like, what, 20 hours of sun. Uh, and the crazy part was when you go on the Dalton Highway, they tell you, first of all, you will break a windshield because the trucks throw up these rocks, right? Yeah. And how long were we on the Dalton Highway before our windshield got hit? Well, it, the first... Three or four miles are paved, and then about 26 seconds into the unpaved part, we immediately shattered the windshield. Yeah, a truck came by and threw up a rock the size of a softball. I thought it was going to land in my face, and luckily it hit the bottom of the wind frame, uh, windshield frame and uh, shattered the windshield. But if it had, I think, hit the windshield itself in the middle of it, it would have been ugly. And these trucks don't stop, right? They're flying down the road like 75 miles an hour and just throwing up all kinds of rocks. The second thing they say that you need uh, is an additional spare tire. Yep, additional spare tire, additional fuel, and a CB radio. Yeah, because uh, from Fairbanks to um, the midpoint, what was that town called? Ooh, Dead Horse? No, that's not Dead No, 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 definitely not Dead Horse. Are you sure about that? Yeah, I'm positive about that, yeah. Anyway, the, the, it's also the longest stretch of American Highway without a fuel stop, so you have to oh, be able to go about 250 miles. Dead Horse is a town in Prudhoe Bay. Yeah, it's not it, no. It's the one in the middle. It's uh, the truck Coldfoot. St- yeah, Coldfoot. It's Coldfoot. And uh, Coldfoot is basically this uh, truck stop in the middle between Fairbanks and Prudhoe Bay where um, you can get dinner, you can find a hotel room, uh, and you can buy gas. And I remember because it's so far in the middle of nowhere, you can buy gas at like $5 a gallon – and you can buy it or you don't, right? Oh, it was it's not, more than that. It was, it was like nine dollars a gallon. It was crazy. Yeah, you can get dinner. I remember dinner at, at that truck stop was like thirty five bucks a person, and you could have dinner or not. Yeah. And you can stop basically at this hotel, which is basically like a double wide trailer where you get like one little room for like three hundred a night, and you could sleep there or not. And the thing is, is you have to fill up at Coldfoot, the halfway point, in order to get to Dead Horse at Prudhoe Bay, right? Because it's a two hundred and forty stretch route with no services whatsoever. So you want to have a little bit of reserve in the tank in case you, you you need to you know fix something or whatever to get to Dead Horse at Prudhoe Bay because if you don't you're gonna be really stranded and so so I was feeling really kind of like hardcore right we're in this Wrangler we've got our spare tire we've got a CB radio in case something goes wrong we've got our bear spray because there's all kinds of wild animals 
uh, and uh, you know, feeling like, hey, I'm doing something really, you know, like exploring the the Arctic Circle. Which, by the way, you go past, right? You go into the Arctic Circle. Yep. And so we get to Coldfoot, and I look up, and there's this guy in a Miata, Tommy. Remember this? A guy in a Miata that's covered in mud with a spare tire in the passenger seat because that's the only place you could put it. Yeah. Like a giant mud ball that's coming down from uh, Prudhoe Bay, and my ego just went. Pfft. You know, I'm in a Wrangler. This guy's in a Miata convertible, covered in mud. You know who that was, right? Yeah, it was Tom Ford who was writing for Top Gear UK magazine. He was doing a story about driving a, a Miata to Prudhoe Bay. Really, really interesting guy, and it was a really cool story. And it, it goes to show, like, the road is is dirt, right? right? And there's washboards and potholes and whatever. But you can do it in just about any car if you're brave enough and if you have enough spare tires. Yeah. And that's exactly what he was doing. Now, the interesting thing about some of the stretches, right, is the second day we were out there. Right, so it, let's talk about it. We drove up to Coldfoot, which is 250 miles about right. the first day. And then we ran into Top Gear. And then we stayed at that $300 a night double wide. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the next day we were going to drive to Prudhoe Bay and spend the night at Prudhoe Bay. But what did we end up doing? Well, we read that we had to if we didn't want to get stuck on the highway in the dark, which we didn't. But it, it, by the time we got to Prudhoe Bay, we were making such good time, it was like 1 o'clock p.m., right? Yeah. So we decided just to cannonball all the way back to Fairbanks yeah. on the dirt road. So that day we drove 750 miles. Mm-hmm. It was a long day. It was, and we got back to Fairbanks at like 3 in the morning, yep. which is still light out. Yeah, it was. Well, it was. Oh, kind of light out. Sort of. Well, yeah, and the reason we didn't stay at Prudhoe Bay is because there's not a hell of a lot to do up in Prudhoe Bay. It's just a, it's an well, oil it's mining an, town, right? There's yeah. just it, Unless you're there, like, actually mining. And remember the craziest thing? So we're getting, you know, we're feeling like, you know, this is adventure. We're way into the Arctic Circle. We're going as far north as anybody ever has in a Wrangler. And the Wrangler did really well, by the way. It was old JK, uh, Rubicon. You know, didn't mind the mud, didn't mind the dirt, just kept trudging along. It did really well. It got a little bit hung up on the endless miles of washboard. Yeah, that, so the, washboard the solid was. axles kind of got a little freaked out after 50 miles, which is constant vibration. But the crazy thing is, is it's uh, it's kind of like a classic adventure road. So you see a lot of dirt bikes, you see some crazy people on mountain bikes, and we actually saw a guy in a unicycle. That's right. Yeah, like like 50 miles outside of Prudhoe Bay, there's this dude from India who's like uh, on a unicycle. He flew into Prudhoe Bay, and he was going to ride his unicycle, his off-road unicycle, like 500 miles back down to Fairbanks. And there are bears, there are musk, uh, there are wolves, there are coyotes. We saw wolves. Well, you know why he did that, right? Because he was crazy? No, because he was trying to get from the highest point in North America to the southernmost point in South America. To uh, Terra de Fuego. Yeah, so he was, he was going to ride his bike or his unicycle all the way down. Uh, 40 miles in, he was looking pretty cooked. So I'd be curious to see if he ended up making it. Hopefully in... What was it, five years since we did that? Yeah. <laughs> he made it down. And if you guys want to see actually that dude and you want to see our adventure, just go to uh, TFL Car and just do a search for Motor Mountain USA and you'll see every highest point in America that we reached uh, in our Wrangler. Yeah, it was really cool and definitely an adventure worth doing if you ever have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that was probably you know uh, a test by fire in terms of getting to know a brand and a, and a Jeep just because, you know, we spent so much time in that vehicle driving across all of America. And the other cool thing we did, we actually went to Hawaii and went to the highest point on the Big Island as well and got to drive from ocean to mountaintop to snow uh, on the Big Island. We did, yeah. And that one we actually decided to rent a Jeep just because of the shipping cost was enormous. Yeah. To and you can rent them pretty easily. Yeah, super Wranglers, easily. Yeah, yeah and um, – you know, I was pretty young at the time, so I only went along with some of the the, the adventures because I was still in high school. But Nathan and Andre, they did the entire Midwest. Yep. Uh, they had some adventures with Emmy Hall, too. Yep. Do you remember Emmy? Yep. And they actually took uh, this little pop-up trailer that the Jeep gave us because initially we thought we would camp the whole time uh, and we would tow a trailer behind us. So they actually took it on the Rubicon Trail. And believe me, pulling a trailer on the Rubicon Trail – uh, even in a Rubicon Wrangler, is not something that I would recommend, even with a pintle hitch, which is the kind of hitch you need to get the trailer over the Rubicon Trail. So they, they were pretty adventurous to do that. Yep, and I remember <laughs> Nathan almost got assaulted in Roswell, New Mexico. What happened? Remember that? He went to like some really sketchy truck stop <laughs> where they were going to try to do like a video with these aliens, and souvenirs and whatever, <laughs> and the guys were just... Very, um, very Roswellian. Yeah, to yeah. put it friendly, and they were they were not too pleased about his cameras. Yeah, so we had uh, you know 
a boatload of adventures. I think we did 52 vi- 50 videos for each of the 50 states. Uh, and, yeah, go check that out. I'm really proud of the fact that the whole team came together and did that uh, and, you know, brought the Jeep community with us. Yeah, so now I think it's time to actually call the big cheese. Yep. Jim, and, and see what's going on with the future of Jeep and what's in the works. All right, Tommy, guess who's on the phone? Well, it's it's a Jeep hero if you're a Jeep fan. <laughs> it's Jim. Hey, Jim, thank you for taking the time uh, to chat with us. This is Jim Morrison, who is head of Jeep for North America. So um, how are you doing, Jim? Are you okay? Is your family okay? You know, we're doing, uh, we're doing well, adjusting a little bit to... Uh you know this this life at home. You know I find myself with my uh, commute going from you know 25 minutes to uh, three seconds as I go from my kitchen over to my desk. Um, and uh, you know I even find myself though you know uh, driving around uh, the yard in my uh, in my uh, Gladiator, finding excuses to you know put stuff in the truck to take it from my house over to the barn just so you can say you uh, you've been in the car. But it's uh, it's a different world and and. Uh, you know, we're making the adjustments we need to, but it's uh, it's certainly uh, a, a different uh, way to look at the at the world right now. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was just reading about recently is that FCA, right, the parent company of Jeep, of course, uh, Fiat Chrysler, is helping out in many different ways. Let's talk about that. So I, I read that you guys are helping to feed kids. Uh, what are you doing? Well, there's there's uh, feeding kids because that's you know really important with yeah. uh, with a lot of kids you know out of school and you know, kind of looking forward to going to school to get uh, to get a solid uh, uh, set of meals in a day. So we're helping out that way. You know, we've also uh, you know are producing uh, masks and helping distribute masks to uh, uh, to uh, people in need. You know, the hospitals and and um, uh, and the first responders. Um, you know, to help with uh, protection against the uh, virus and, you know, even have uh, some of the engineers over in Italy and kind of kicked off with the Ferrari guys, you know, to help with uh, with the ventilators. So kind of a, a lot of uh, hard work to be uh, proud of as part of, you know, being part of the, uh, the Fiat Chrysler group. Yeah, and it's got to be especially daunting uh, to be, you know, a company that is kind of headquartered in both Italy and in North America, uh, where you know we're now the two hardest hits, hardest hit uh, areas of the world in some ways, and China. So that's got to be especially challenging. I, I'm sure you guys are pulling out your hair trying to figure out, you know, how how you move ahead and when you move ahead. That, that's got to be, you know, you're making light of it, but I, I would assume there's a lot of a lot of serious discussions taking place on how we get through this. Yeah, for sure, and it's you know it's a serious topic, and you know one of the things we have been learning is you know as as how you know the customers and and the employees you know over in in Italy have you know been they're further along with it, so we're we're learning you know from them how to uh, to cope and and uh, and and work. Uh, with what you know what's going on for sure yeah yeah so let's talk about kind of um incentives i just read that uh there's some great incentives out there right now uh if you want to buy a jeep you know in the places you can still buy a jeep what are you guys doing there how are you kind of helping to to take this thing out of the out of the tail for a lot of people well what's really interesting is you know we've kind of looked at what the customers you know really need help with right now and a lot of that is kind of payment deferrals so you know starting with our customers that um you know that have uh, Jeeps with us today. You know, if they if they need help with deferrals, we're kind of working with uh, with them. You know, if they've uh, you know don't have an income for the next uh, few months, we're trying to sort out ways to uh, to work around that with them. And then if you're still in the in the marketplace for a new vehicle, uh, and there's a lot of parts of the country that are still you know pretty active in in shopping. You know, we've got uh, some really good deals out there. We've got zero percent for 84 months, which you know is is a uh, is kind of a um, a, a new but long deal for uh, you know for vehicles. We just put that on Grand Cherokee here um, a uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and uh, you know we're really we had a really good Grand Cherokee close to the month here just uh, just yesterday, and a lot of people are still looking for deals, um, and then uh, making no payments available for them for uh, for 90 days. So kind of getting them outside of the uncertain period. You know, a lot of people, you know, if their leases are coming up, if they're, you know, looking for different options, we're trying to be very uh, easy to do business with, as well as uh, we've set up a new online retailing system. If you go into jeep.com and, you know, kind of scroll down, you can see, you know, some of the things that we're doing with the online shopping and, and uh, driveway delivery now for uh, for customers. So, you know, really easy. You can go through the whole experience online. 
you know, trade your car, get the credit uh, all looked after, and then, you know, look out to uh, your driveway and, uh, you know, you've got a new Jeep sitting there. So it's uh, it's a nice process that we've uh, kind of pulled forward that we were working on to make it, uh, um, you know, usable and helpful in this uh, in this time with the virus. Yeah, it was crazy because I was looking, you know, we do um, numbers at the beginning of the month. And today, of course, when this is being recorded, is the beginning of the month. And actually, uh, I was astounded to see that a lot of uh, vehicles and specifically trucks have been up uh, through March, which is incredible. You know, the Ram brand is doing really well. Uh, and you would think that, uh, you know, sales of vehicles would take a nosedive because in a lot of places, of course, dealerships are closed. And yet, uh, you know, it's it's been pretty astounding to see that, uh, you know, certain vehicles are not just doing well, but are actually doing better than expected. Yeah, Texas specifically hasn't, you know, really slowed down to the degree that the rest of the country has. So, um, as you know, a lot of uh, trucks are sold in Texas, about a quarter of them. So, you know, that uh, that really, um, you know, has, has made the trucks out of the business. And we've seen it with uh, with Gladiator as well. You know, we're um, um, continuing to roll pretty hard with Gladiator, with uh, even though, you know, it's. Um, um, it's a it's a downturn in the uh, in the business, but uh, one of the things that is really you know kind of fun to watch is the overall demand is continuing to grow. And you know, for a brand like Jeep that has got you know American and family and freedom kind of at the core of its being, you know, it's it's that those are the three things that really resonate well with uh, with Americans. And I don't know if you saw it a couple of uh, uh, a couple of days ago, but there was a there was a new. Um, a study that came out it was done by younggov.com and they said you know jeep consideration is is trending up more than any other uh, uh brand in america right now uh from those people that were looking forward to uh, buying a vehicle over the next 12 months so you know I, again i think you know for a for a brand that kind of started you know in in um need with a war you know it knows how to uh, pull through the long term and and um, really uh, help wave the American flag, which, you know, a lot of uh, customers want to do. Do you think that uh, once we get through the back end of this, that there's going to be some pent-up demand, not just for for Jeeps in general, but in terms of, I know I'm feeling it, you know, the, the, the uh, demand to go out and get the heck out of town and explore, you know, the wonders that is America, right, all of our national parks. Do you think, do you think that's a potential uh, silver lining to this dark cloud that we're living through right now? Yeah, you know, for sure, I think uh, we, we really are um, expecting something like that, Roman. And it's either, you know, the people of, you know, that were you know, expected to be out in Moab this week. In fact, if you remember that, um, you know, a couple of years ago, um, you and, and uh, your gang and me and my gang were hanging out at uh, Milt's, I think, for, uh, yeah. um, you know, for a, our, uh, for a, for a, burgers. a burger yeah. out of Moab. Yeah. And, and, you know, whether it's that or, you know, taking the Jeep on the trail or just, you know, taking your top off and doors off and just, you know, enjoying the freedom. You know, I do think once, you know, the the, uh, the world kind of settles down and gets some stability, I think we're indeed going to be looking at, uh, you know, um, some pent-up demand, kind of people looking to celebrate and, and get back to normal. Yeah, before we get into I want to talk about kind of specific vehicles that, that we have here at the office, and we've got two, and I want to kind of talk about them. We've got the new Wrangler uh, diesel, which is pretty cool, and we've done a bunch of videos with that, and, of course, the new Mojave, which, um, you know, is uh, – kind of the desert runner version of the gladiator but how's mark doing i mean i was so bummed out to hear that you know he mark allen who's the chief designer for jeep every year at the easter jeep safari brings out you know let's say a half a dozen concepts which then foreshadow the future and pay homage to the past of the brand he's got to be super bummed that you guys couldn't go and do it this year it's, it's you know and it's unusual for a brand to actually do something like like the easter jeep safari right it's it's kind of, I think, in, in a way, the magic sauce behind Jeep, and that is that you guys really listen uh, to your customers. Yeah, you know, I think, and you know, talking to Mark here this morning, and and uh, trying to find ways to still do the uh, cool things with the uh, with the concepts, because the story behind the story is we've got a bunch of them ready to go. You know, I think uh, the paint was drying on a couple, as they always are, kind of the last few minutes. But uh, you know, we were uh, we were ready to roll with kind of our best. Uh, um, our best uh, round of uh, concepts yet, so we're uh, kind of sorting out what to do with those um, here over the next little bit as we uh, as we come back online. But um, you know, talking to Mark and trying to figure out the best way to do that is uh, is all part of. You know, maybe we go back to Moab, maybe we go to different parts of the world. But I think you know, connecting with our customers is still going to be key through those vehicles. So we'll look forward to uh, trying to do some more of that later. Yeah. Any 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 like thought of doing like a Labor Day? 
Jeep Safari instead of an Easter Jeep Safari? Is that, you know, because like a lot of the, the, we have a, we have a 10K race here, which happens on Memorial Day, which isn't going to happen. And they moved it to Labor Day. Same thing with the Olympics. Have you guys given any thoughts actually, you know, trying to move it into the fall when hopefully things are back to business as usual? Well, yeah, the Red Rock Wheelers are the, 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 uh, yeah, they're the, the guys who run it. Yeah. Uh, group that, uh, the Jeep group that, uh, that runs it. And, um, you know, we'll see what, uh, we'll see what makes the most sense for, uh, for everybody. But what was interesting is, is the uh, the government had to actually shut down all the hotels because they and and outlawed camping and outlawed people coming in because they were you know really thinking that uh, no matter what they did the uh, the cheap folks are going to show up in Moab so you know I think we were all trying to hold it together to some degree right up until the last minute but you know when uh, you know when the Utah government you know came down you know we have to uh, really pay attention to staying inside and I think some of our social posts if you go on and look at some of the things that we've done on uh, on our Facebook pages and, and Instagram, we've really you know tried to encourage the fact that you know hey the, the trails are going to be there for us in the end, but uh, you know now is really the time to uh, to respect uh, what's being asked of us and stay inside. So you know it's uh, it's certainly building in, in all of us, and you know the freedom will eventually uh, break out when the time's appropriate, and I think it'll be uh, it'll be fun when it does. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I am going stir crazy. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, great to actually have uh, a Jeep at the office right now. Uh, and it's great to have one that's, um, you know, a diesel. And uh, let's let's talk about the diesel Jeep, Tommy. You know, it, it's funny. I'm, I'm going to be completely upfront with you. When, when I first went on the program for that Jeep, I kind of fell in love with it. And then when we got it here at the office, I was like, uh, it's kind of heavy. The payload's not great. Uh, and we did some drag racing with it. It was pretty fast. And then it, it went away, and then we got it back, and I've been kind of, you know, driving. You know, it's only me and Tom here at the office, so we're, we're social distancing <laughs> ourselves as family. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah but since yeah. we live together, it's, I think it's okay that we work out of the same office together. Uh, but I've been really enjoying that Jeep. It's, uh, uh, it's got a ton of torque. Uh, it sounds badass. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it goes forever. What's your, yeah, you, what do you think of that Jeep, Tommy, now that we're driving it around? Well, Jim, kind of talk about the market behind that Wrangler. You know, why does it exist? What, who's it for? Well, Tommy, that, that actually has got a little bit of history to even back when I was at Jeep the first time is that was the number one request from our customers. They wanted us to put the diesel in a Wrangler. And, um, you know, what they were looking for was the ultimate in torque. And uh, what they what we ended up doing is getting a really good package that's easy to live with every day. You know the uh, the sport of the Sahara gets 29 miles per gallon on the uh, on the highway. You know 550 miles range. You know along with delivering the the incredible torque that makes that uh, Rubicon just unbelievable. And I think um, you know my best experience with uh, with that was actually on the Rubicon Trail when uh, I got all the way up uh, you know Cadillac Hill in four high. Wow. It had so much it had so much torque it would just walk its way up the uh, the rocks. Um, but I think what was really cool is, you know, two hours from Lake Tahoe into the Rubicon, you know, two days across the Rubicon, and then, and then two hours back to uh, Tahoe, and still had half a tank of fuel. So, you know, anything else that has got that kind of torque on the trail usually has a couple of jerry cans, you know, in order to get it through the trail, let alone get it, you know, from home, you know, through the trail and back to home. So, you know, I think that was, you know, just proof that our customers knew what they were asking for. And um, and we were happy to deliver it with the Eco Diesel Wrangler. It's uh, it's it's going to be uh, uh, good, especially when we add, when we add that into the uh, and into the Gladiator later in the year as well. Yeah, now, go ahead, Tommy. Yeah, in previous generations, Jim, like you know, in in Europe, you could go out and buy a diesel Wrangler with a little four cylinder, two point eight liter. What was kind of the thinking behind putting the latest Eco Diesel in it versus you know carrying over one of the smaller displacement diesels or one of the ones that that's been available abroad? You know, it was really about the um, the amount of torque that went with those engines wasn't enough, we didn't think, for what the customers were asking us for. So you're right, they were available in Europe for, for a while uh, with the 2.8 and the smaller uh, the smaller diesels, but we really wanted to go all out with, you know, delivering a package that was fun to drive. It's the number one reason people buy a Wrangler is to have fun and to really, you know, provide the, the torque that adds – capability because that's the most capable uh wrangler we've ever done now and then at the same time deliver some you know, great fuel economy and and things that are really easy for uh for customers to live with whether they're you know filling up the wrangler you know once a month now in the in the winter with fuel you know with fuel 
uh, or um, you know taking it on the trail or or just using it as an everyday driver like you guys are now. Yeah, and the cool thing, you know, to me, the magic in that Jeep is if you want really want to build out your rig to something that, you know, is personalized, inevitably, if you end up putting on bigger wheels, bigger tires, you end up running out of power, right? Just because you need more power, more torque to push bigger tires. And uh, this Jeep has so much torque that you, you can pretty much go crazy with it without having to actually go to the aftermarket and start doing things like, you know, adding superchargers or turbochargers to the Pentastar, which is cool, which is really cool. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, yeah, you can put a, a lift and 37s on that thing and and, uh, and it doesn't even slow down and know that it's got them on. So it's uh, it's great to have all that torque on tap. Now, we were lucky enough, and thank you for uh, sending us to Mojave. We got that before it all kind of came tumbling down, uh, and we did take it on the trail, Tommy, and we did a video where we kind of compared the Mojave uh, to the Gladiator uh, trail-rated Rubicon, right? And, and the idea for the, well, why don't you tell us what the idea for the Mojave is? W- where did that come from, and what, what are you, who, who's the buyer for that? Well, you know what, when we look at, the, again, you know, Mojave was an example of us listening to our customers and, and you look at, um, you know, the modifications they're doing to the Wranglers and even some of the early Gladiators. You know, we actually even ran, um, had some success at Baja with uh, winning a couple of classes with uh, early production uh, Gladiators earlier, you know, and, and you know, working, um, you know, over slow over rocks is kind of what Jeep has always been known for. And that's, you know, our trail rated and our Rubicon. So really kind of extending the space and kind of paying attention to what customers were doing to their Jeeps, you know, kind of in a different surface and going fast in the desert and fast on sand uh, was what we're, you know, kind of expanding to with our desert rated, which is now, you know, in the first uh, Mojave. So as Rubicon is to trail rated, um, you know, Mojave is to uh, desert rated. So, you know, five criteria, ride control, stability, traction, ground clearance, maneuverability, Desert prowess is kind of the the benchmark we have to become a desert rated Jeep, and that means you're you're ready to go fast in the sand. So it's uh, it's everything from you know really cool uh, suspension setups. So we've got a two and a half inch bypass set of shocks uh, on the front with external reservoirs, uh, and uh, and in the back you know we even have a um, uh, another uh, front hydraulic uh, system for down bumpers. So when you're going fast over the the um, the dunes. I can't say jump because uh, my uh, lawyers will get mad at me for saying <laughs> jump a jeep. Um, that uh, good you know, alliteration though. Jounce bumpers <laughs> to make it uh, to make it really smooth uh, upon landing, um, and uh, it's wider. And um, and we've even updated, uh, you know, the um, um, reinforced the frame and and uh, put cast iron steering knuckles to really so you can run it hard over speed uh, or uh, or bumps. Uh, with uh, with that, so it's really about a fast speed Jeep over sand, you know, versus kind of what we've been known for historically with, you know, going slow over the rock. So again, listening to our customers and then making a purpose built Jeep to uh, to react to uh, what the market's evolving into. Did you guys ever give some consideration to sticking a Hemi under the hood of that one? Because that seems like if you're going to want to go fast, that's the way to do it. Yeah, you know, let's uh, let's keep this conversation going at some stage here, um, <laughs> good. because because uh, that's good. I will say there is one thing though. I think we screwed up uh, with the Gladiator, and um, and that's the name. Uh, we we should have called it the uh, uh, the Michigan Pothole Eater. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you, I was driving home with my wife the first time I had one of those things, and we live on a on a dirt road. Um, here to get to our farm and and it's i mean it was it was pothole central here a few weeks ago and i was literally going faster and faster down the road uh and and kind of aiming at all the potholes and my wife looked at me and she's why is this thing so smooth and it's like it's it was the uh it was the new mojave so it was a lot of uh, a lot of fun but since then i've you know i've been trying to you know go over rain uh trail uh, train tracks as fast as i can and you know find all the holes and it's uh, it's amazing. Our engineers did a uh, a really good job with uh, that Jeep. It looks cool too, eh? When you when you park it beside it, anything, it's it's got a bit of a lift in the front uh, with a suspension lift, and and uh, it really looks uh, really looks like a cool truck. All right, um, Tommy and I. I don't know if you know this. Uh, um, actually, bought a Tesla because we felt that 
eventually everything's going to go electric, and we wanted to see if a Tesla could go off-road. So we took it Model X and uh, took it off-road and uh, probably had the scariest moment of my life going ever off-roading because I, I was terrified that I was going to drop the bottom of that thing onto a pointy rock and start a fire that would eventually take the whole mountain out. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> You're responsible for, for calling in the National Guard. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Automotive journalist, you know, burns down $50 million worth of structures and, you know, evacuates half of Boulder. Uh, but, but, the reason we did that is because you know that electrification is coming. You guys are, you know, at the forefront of that in some ways. Uh, and at CES this year, you introduced a really good off-road. And if you look over the years, we've gone from, you know, everything from, you know, the first automatic locking hubs to uh, viscous couplings and transfer cases to, you know, first e-lockers to now real lockers and, you know, all of the uh, the really cool things that, you know, Jeep has evolved as, as far as its overall 4x4 leadership. What we're doing with uh, 4xE is a natural extension of that. And if you think about what, you know, electric vehicle can do, um, you know, this is, is going to be incredible. So provide a whole bunch of torque instantly to the ground in a way that can make it even better uh, off-road. And, um, of course, it's going to have some really good on-road and some MPGE and some really uh, you know great range with uh, with with all all electric and all of that kind of stuff kind of rallies together to provide you know what we're calling our four by e lineup you know in a, in a way that is true to the brand um, and then also fun to drive and and uh, as it evolves will be the most capable um, Jeeps in the lineup as well so you know think of uh, you know going through uh, the craziest uh, trail you can with the doors off and the top off and whisper quiet you know with more torque on tap than you could ever imagine that's uh you know that's what the uh, the new four by user are going to be all about now jim you know here's a question for you you know the jeep brand i think for so long has been synonymous with getting out into the uh the, the wilderness going for adventures you know capturing that american spirit and it, it seems like for a number of years the notion people have with electricity is you know limited range onward only how are you going to convince customers how are you going to convince um potential buyers that uh, you can, in fact, take a technology that that's been built on on-road vehicles and and transition into the the off-road realm. How are you gonna How are you gonna make that that capability withstand there? Well, I think Tommy, that's that's the uh, that's the piece which I think fits perfect with with plugins for us. So, you know, you can run it for uh, so many miles on electric, or you can switch it over to um, you know to run off the uh, the engine. Um, or you can do it the other way around, which we think a lot of people are going to do. You know, think of yourself, you know, at a Moab, you're plugged in, you know, whether it be, you know, at the pancake house or at the at the hotel, you know, and then, but you want to save all your electric for the for going on the trail for a day or two. You know, you drive out to the trail on uh, on gas power and then flip your, uh, flip your Jeep onto electric, you know, and like a lot of people would flip their Jeep uh, onto electric as they're driving into, uh, you know, the city in Europe. Um, you know, you flip your your uh, Jeep into electric as you're driving onto the trail, and uh, and I think that's going to be really what takes all the range anxiety out of it, and uh, really makes these vehicles something you can live with every day. Are we eventually heading toward a full EV Wrangler? Is that possible? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go with maybe. <laughs> <laughs> because look, the, the problem, of course, with EVs right now is um, range, range, range. Right? Uh, it's yes. like real estate. You know, it's location, location, location. Uh, and and Jeeps, just you know, especially Wranglers, just by their design, aren't very aerodynamic. You know, they're, they're not exactly the ideal platform to build something that's going to get a lot of range. And so th- that's got to be something that your engineers must be wrestling with. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> All right, fair, I don't know. All right, I don't know. All right, yeah. fair, fair, fair enough, yeah. Jim. Uh, when yeah. when when are we going to be able to see the four by E's? When are those going to hit the marketplace? The, the you know the, the current ones that you've shown already. Yeah, well, I you know we 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 don't know when the next auto show is going to be. It keeps yeah. changing. You know, we just had unfortunately Detroit. Yeah, Detroit got canceled. You know, and yeah. and now uh, New York is moving. So. You know, you you, uh, you probably would have been sitting in it next uh, next weekend. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but who knows now? But uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll have to get you know that that message out and and continue to uh, you know to, to deliver what's going to be a really uh, a really good uh, a really good Jeep and you know in keeping with you know what the uh, what the lineup is all about and and really help deliver something you know that the marketplace is going to look for. I think. 
Well, Jeep, thank, uh, thank you, Jim, very much for taking the time to talk with us, uh, giving us some insight into what both Jeep and FCA are doing right now, you know, at a very difficult time for everybody. Uh, and um, I, I guess I would say if you guys are out there and you're, you know, jonesing uh, for some Jeep time, uh, go in your driveway, take the roof off, <laughs> turn off the radio, and drive around the block, you know. I mean, good God. Uh, it still is restorative, you know. You, yeah. You, you got to there's nothing better than, you know, taking the top off and, and feeling that freedom. And, you know, whether it's, you know, just as, you, as you're driving across, you know, and your, and your neighbor's driveway and then back into your own uh, <laughs> or just or just, you know, sitting there and, you know, throw a fan on the, uh, you know, on the Jeep, you know, take the doors off and, and uh, you know, enjoy the open air freedom, however, uh, however you want to. But or it's, it's or uh, you, I'm sure you guys are still still selling your Mopar parts, right? So go get yourself some, you know, a better bumper, a better lift and, and you know, slap it on that bad boy while you're while you're stuck at home and do some, you know, wrenching. It's, you know, the number one um, vehicle in the world for customization. So, you know, everybody was kind of working really hard and fast to get ready for uh, uh, to get ready for Moab with their latest mods. And and uh, now that they're uh, they have a few more you know weeks until their next uh, trail run, they've got more time you know, to, to amp up that mod again and and uh, and really uh, test it out. So. No, there's a lot of uh, really cool things as long as you have a Jeep. Yep, exactly right. Well, thank you once again for coming on the show. Really and, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah really appreciate it. Uh, stay safe. Uh, and, you know, let's hope that maybe we can get together someplace uh, for the Labor uh, Day safari or something like that. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, because you know, I, I, I look that. forward to that with, with you guys. You know, Roman and Tommy, you guys are doing a great job you know, keeping everybody a little bit uh, – you know, entertained with and informed with all the latest videos, and and uh, I know you know you guys always do one of the best jobs of anybody out there with all of our uh, Easter Jeep Safari concepts. So we'll have to make sure that we uh, we get you in those and and keep that uh, uh, that uh, inspiration and you know good feedback flowing because we love reading your comments as much as we like watching your videos because. You know that's where our customers, you know, really give it give us a chance to uh, connect with them. So keep doing everything you guys do, and and uh, we'll keep making cool jeeps. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Very kind of you. Yeah, say hi to Mike and Mark, and uh, stay safe. Take good care. Okay, yeah, take appreciate care. it. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.